and expose the work of the enemy that often goes unnoticed, even in Christians' lives. And we're actually going to look at what does the Bible associate most, the Bible, what does it associate most with the work of the devil, this being that we know who is the enemy of God, the opponent of God, the adversary of God, what does the Bible, when the Bible speaks about the devil or Satan, what does it associate, what behaviors, what characteristics does it associate with this arch enemy of God more than anything? And I believe the answer is going to be quite surprising to many that are listening today, but it is the Word of God, and that's what we are going to to go with. You know, like that? That is the faulty mental picture that is painted in our minds today about Satan. He is this horrible looking creature who is very self evident, who, if you came in contact with him, you would know that he does not have your best interest in mind. That's the picture that Hollywood paints. That's the picture that books and magazines and cartoons paint. But that is false. That is not what Satan looks like. That is not who Satan is. Let me remind you of what Scripture says. And you can go read it for yourself. Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14. When God is addressing the force behind evil rulers, the king of Tyre and the king of Babylon... He, he talks about Satan, and he talks about how Satan was one of the greatest creations of God, how he was full of wisdom and adorned with beauty. He was one of the highest ranking of God's creation in what we would call the angelic host, divine beings that God created as his sons. And so he's very intelligent. He's very gifted. He is a masterpiece that God created. So, the devil, whom we know, actually began as a good guy. And he became a bad guy. So the question needs to be asked, if we're talking about the devil and we want to expose his work, how did the good guy become the bad guy? And the answer is very self-evident. All you have to do is read the text. When he stopped submitting to God's word. When he stopped submitting to God's word, he became the enemy or the opponent of God. Now, let's look at the root of the problem. Why did he stop doing God's word? This is really, really easy. Because he wanted to. <laughs> Why did he want to? Because he wanted to do things his way. He had this idea. You know what? Why is everything God created worshiping him? And why did he appoint me the leader of such task? Everything should be worshiping me. That was his thought. In other words, he said, I want to be in charge. I want to be in control. Why should God be? You know what that's called? Selfish ambition. He was concerned with self. He didn't care about the effects or the results of his decision to rebel against God. He didn't care how that affected the other angels that he had rank over that he could influence. He didn't care or consider any of that because all he was concerned about was getting worship for himself. And he was willing to sacrifice anything and any created being that stood in his way. So we need to understand, first and foremost, this picture is not Satan. Satan doesn't come and knock on our door and us open the door and we see him looking like this and him say, I just wanted to let you know that I'm here to destroy your life, to destroy your marriage, to destroy your relationships, 
to destroy everything about you. And ultimately, at the end, my greatest desire is that you would be eternally separated from God like I'm going to be. No, he doesn't do that. He's tricky. He's sneaky. He's deceptive. And I hate to say this because I hate to give him any credit. He actually is very good at what he does. And I have watched him with my own eyes over years of being in ministry deceive and trick hundreds of people. Hundreds of people. And it's sad. And I believe that one of the ways that we can put a stop to that is teaching like this. Expose his work. Calling him out. Shining the light on the dirty work that he does behind the scenes that goes unnoticed. It's a reality that exists today, and it's a reality that has always existed. Watch what Paul says in the first century to the church at Ephesus. And this is taken from the NET. Clothe yourselves with the full armor of God. And I want to stop right there for just a moment because when you investigate the full armor of God, all of the, the armor of God goes back to His Word. All of it. Everything is associated with the knowledge of God's Word, understanding of God's Word, the application of God's Word. Okay? So he says, Can clothe yourselves with the full armor of God so that you may be able, so that you are equipped to stand against... Notice he doesn't say fight against. We don't go devil hunting and devil chasing, right? We stand against the schemes of the devil. The word schemes there means the craftiness, the scheming, and in particular, the lying in wait. Okay? So Paul is asking the the church at Ephesus to equip themselves to be able to stand against the craftiness of the devil. So what does that tell us? That the devil was their opponent. And he had ill intentions for the church at Ephesus. Now, do you think he has those same intentions today as he did then, 2,000 years ago? I think possibly more so, because I believe that he knows that time is even shorter now than it was then. I mean, that's a given. 2,000 years has passed. Jesus hasn't come. Obviously, we're closer to his return, and therefore, you would think that his assault possibly would intensify. Now, to investigate and look at and expose the work of the enemy, I think the best way to do that is to look at where we first see the enemy appear in, in our Bible. Anyone want to guess where that is? We've looked at this passage many times, but I'm going to point out some things that maybe you've overlooked um, and just hopefully shed a different light on this passage. But it's found in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent, the word serpent there is nachash, which, which is the same root which uh, means divination or witchcraft, associated with witchcraft, seducing, seduction. Now the serpent, the seducer, was more subtle, cunning or crafty, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now beast of the field, when you look at Jesus' teaching, uh, represents the enemy, the enemy that is opposed to God. And it says that the serpent, the Nachash, the seducer, was more cunning and crafty than the other beings that God had created. Um, you don't believe this was a literal serpent talking to Eve, right? We need to be delivered from biblical literalism because I don't believe Scripture says that it was a literal serpent at all. And if you want to hear more on that, you can go to YouTube and look at our Genesis series. I'll talk more about it. But for, for today, I don't have time to go that direction. But I want you to look at what happens when we see the serpent on the scene. 
And he said unto the woman. We have to stop right there. Because the Hebrew grammar leaves no other option than this reality. Adam and Eve are both standing there. So why is it significant that he says to the woman what he's about to say? Because the enemy always picks on the weaker vessel. The enemy always goes after someone who is not the authority many times, but is close to or has influence over the authority figure. Who's the authority in the garden? Adam. That's not even debatable. Adam named the animals. Adam was in charge of planet Earth. He was in charge of the garden. Because the Bible says that he put man, Adam, in the garden to keep it and to work it. Right? That's what Genesis chapter 2 tells us in particular. So the enemy slithers in, and he preys on the weaker vessel. And even though Adam is standing there, and this is where Adam messed up. He should have usurped his authority, and he should have stepped in, and he should have put a stop to what the enemy was doing and saying and the manipulation that we're about to read that takes place. So this is where this authority is going to step in, and I'm going to say, uh-uh. And I'm going to expose the serpent, okay? Because I'm going to learn from Adam's mistake. And so he slithers in, and he said, directed to the woman. Yea, has God said? What is he doing here? He is questioning the authority of God's word. We need to be on guard against that. You catch it? Has God said? But notice how he, he, he says it. In a manipulative, deceptive manner. He doesn't come out and say, God's a big jerk. He does it subtly. He drops little subtle tones. And he does it to the woman. Because he believes that he has a better chance at manipulating her. And guess what? He's right. Because he tricks her. Paul tells us that the woman was tricked and Adam sinned willfully. Adam knew. And that's where he should have stepped in and protected his wife. But he didn't. So the enemy says, Has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, who was that command actually given to? Adam. And he was the overseer to make sure that that command was carried out. But he stands idly and passively by, which is not right for him to do. Okay? So he asked this question, and it's a baited question. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden... This would be the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God hath said, you shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, we don't have any record of God saying that you can't touch it, just simply that you don't eat it. But obviously, if you don't touch it, you won't eat it. Okay? So she affirms what has been said. Now, watch what the serpent does. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. Now, he contradicts God's word openly and blatantly, but watch what he does in the next verse that kind of tones it down a little bit and kind of disguises uh, the rebelliousness of his statement. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, there's elements of truth in that because their eyes would be open. They would have a different outlook of good and evil, right? So there's elements of truth, 
But he blatantly contradicts what God's word says and says, you will not die, which is a lie. And then he says, God knows that if you eat, your eyes will be open and you shall be as gods. In other words, God's holding back something from you. There's a better way. Uh, he's got this in his tone. I'm looking out for you. What is he doing? He is casting doubt on the character of God. Like God is holding back something from Adam and Eve that they need to experience. And you know what he's doing at the same time when he does that? When he is challenging the character of God and casting doubt on the character of God, what is he doing to his status? Right? Naturally. He doesn't have to promote himself uh, just openly and outright by being the one to tell them this thing, that this big secret that God's keeping something back from them. That is going to cause them to what? Doubt God. Not to trust him. And it's going to cause them to what? Trust him. Because after all, he's got this big secret that God's been keeping from them. That there's a better way. There's a better life. They could have a greater status. And, you know, I'm looking out for you. I'm telling you what God doesn't want you to know. Because he's keeping something back. So what he's actually doing is he's tearing down God to build up himself. Why would he do that? Because their obedience was worship to God. And if he could get them to obey him, in essence, he is getting them to worship him, which is exactly what he's always wanted, worship. Everything that God created, he doesn't want it or them to bow to God. He wants them to bow to who? Him. How do they do that? By doing what he says. And he does it very sneaky. Now watch what happens. Because the, because the enemy is speaking subtly and in, in, in his craftiness to the woman, Adam refuses to usurp his authority to step in and say, uh-uh, not on my turf, not in my garden. Get out of here. Watch what happens. And when the woman saw, what happens here? Her perception has changed. About two things. God, right? And Rick hit on this while I was gone. I listened to it on the app. He talked about perception. When the woman saw, her perception changed about the tree, and it also changed about God. Because if she believed God and trusted God, she wouldn't have ate from the tree, right? Right? So she doesn't believe God. She believes the serpent. Why? Because he tricked her. Watch what it says. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, to make one have elite understanding in Hebrew. When she perceived the tree to be able to give that to her, which is everything the world promises. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Status. The tree would make her understanding, right? What is that? An elevated status. I mean, who are Adam and Eve competing with anyway? You're the only ones, right? It's amazing, but that's the enemy. He deceives. So he changed her perception. Now, she saw the tree in her mind as if it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and it would make her wise. She saw it that way, but was it true? That's not a trick question. You can go ahead and say it. No. It wasn't true. It wasn't good for food because God said it wasn't. It wasn't really going to make them wise like they thought. So it was a lie. Right? 
but did she believe it? So she thought it was true. So she thought it was what? Truth. But was it? No. Why was it not? Because it is in contradiction to God's word, and only God's word is true. But he changed her perception. He did it subtly, and he done it in his crafty skill. And what happens when she saw it that way? When her perception changed, what did she do? She acted on what she believed. Did you know you'll obey what you really believe? You should tweet that. You'll actually obey what you really believe. Paul actually talks about that in Romans. He says, whoever you obey is your master, and you are its servant. Whether that be Christ unto eternal life or sin unto death. So what did she do? She took of the fruit thereof, and she did eat. And misery loves company, so she gave it to her husband. And he did eat. Did you know if you entertain the serpent, you will be deceived? You will. And that's exactly what happened to Eve when her perception about God changed. So what did Satan subtly do to God? He subtly accused him of trying to withhold something that they needed. He tried to offer them a better way and a better life, something more than what God had given them. And he tricked them. Let's look at Revelation for just a moment because names tell us a lot in the Bible. Names are not arbitrary like they are today. We don't look in the kitty book. Or they didn't look in the kitty book back then and think, oh, no other kid has this name, so let's name our kid this. Names had meaning and they had purpose. And it's no different with Satan. For example, let's look at the names, the name of God, Yahweh. That was the one name that was designated to the one true and living God that set him apart from all the other gods that were believed in by all the other people groups, right? His name, you know what his name means? The one who was and is and is to come. The self-existent one. Why is he the self-existent one? Because Genesis 1 and verse 1 comes right out of the gate establishing this reality that God is the creator. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is self-sufficient. Jesus, Yehoshua, God saves or God is salvation. Well, isn't that pretty much what Jesus is all about and what he came to offer to this world? Absolutely. Well, what about the names or the titles that are associated or given to this enemy of God that we know as the devil or Satan? Let's look at what Revelation 12, and this takes place at the exaltation of Christ after his passion. And the great dragon, which is connecting him with this sea monster or sea uh, serpent or this beast of the sea, which is all throughout Old Testament poetic literature, Leviathan and things like that, the Tanin, the crocodile, the serpent in Genesis 3. Uh, but... Because he comes from the sea, sea in the Old Testament represents chaos or disorder, right? What was covering the earth when God recreates the earth to inhabit uh, human beings and, and life, to sustain life? Water. The water represents chaos in the Old Testament. So he is the, the beast of chaos, which Revelation describes the beast coming up where? Out of the sea and out of the land. So he's the great dragon, was cast out. That old serpent, what is it doing here in saying it that way? Identifying him with the passage that we just read in Genesis chapter 3. He is the deceiver, the seducer, uh, the nachash of chapter 3 of Genesis. Watch this, though. It shows us his titles, called the devil and Satan. And we're going to look at Satan here in just a moment. But let's look at devil. 
The word devil is a Greek word that has a Greek uh, beginning, and it is diabolos. Diabolos. And devil, as we know it in English, the definition of it actually is one who engages in slander. What is slander? It's making a false spoken statement damaging a person's reputation. Didn't he do that in the garden? He made a false statement to Eve, right? That defamed the reputation of God. And when he could defame the reputation of God, what happened? She stopped trusting God. And what did she do in in place of that? Trusting him, which is exactly what the enemy wanted to do. Misery loves company. So, uh, notice that it doesn't say someone who steals, someone who cheats, although those would be attributes of the devil. But the term that is designated or associated with the enemy of God is one who engages in slander. Now, let me ask you a question. Would listening to others who criticize and critique others in a way that defames their reputation, would that be engaging? Just listening, would that be engaging? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've seen some light bulbs c- come on. Like, Oh, no, can we have the altar call right now? I've done it before, guys, and I think probably everyone in this room has. You know what you do when you entertain someone criticizing someone else? You know what that does? It creates a filter. If Jerry came to me and started talking about Rick in a way that would hurt his reputation, that would damage his influence, in my life. If I listened to him long enough, you know what that would do? It would create a filter. It would cause me to question or doubt Rick, and so I would start looking at Rick through critical lens, considering the possibility of what may be true because it's something that I heard. Did you know that's not fair to Rick? I'm not giving him an honest chance to prove what kind of person he is. And believe it or not, in the church, we're actually called to judge one another, but we're not called to judge one another based on hearsay. We're supposed to judge one another based on what we see and experience firsthand with one another. But so often, I have seen uh, these filters created because people get upset, people get offended, and so they want to share it with somebody, right? Right? so that they can influence others to side with them. That's not biblical. It can happen in church. It can happen at the workplace. It can happen in social circles. And what we need to do is we need to recognize when other people are tearing others down that we have a responsibility to step in and do what Adam didn't do and say, stop now. Did you know if you actually use the phrase Jesus used against one of his own followers, I rebuke you, Satan, they will stop really quickly. They will. Because they'll be offended by being called Satan, but that's exactly what they are. Diabolos, devil, is one who engages in slander. So we need to step back and look in the mirror and say, am I a devil? This may not be your most popular message, but it's okay. God has your back. Let's look at the next title. We might as well have fun with it. I'm trying to help you guys because this is a serious, serious problem in our culture because our culture depends so much on social stuff, which much of it is just unfruitful nonsense. Revelation 12 and verse 9, again, 
Notice that I have underlined the second term that is associated with this enemy of God, and that is what? Satan, or in, it take, taken from the Hebrew word Satan, and that means adversary, opponent, one who hinders a purpose, and that purpose being God's purpose. And that's exactly what we've seen in the garden, right? He slithered in, did his business, and he hindered the purpose. He, in, he, he hindered what God desired and what would have benefited Adam and Eve as well, right? And so, an adversary or an opponent, one who hinders a purpose. And God's purpose is what? His word. His word is his will, and his word is his purpose. So, let me ask you a question. Why would he want to hinder God's purpose? We answered it earlier. Selfish ambition, which is rooted in what? Pride, which is what? Self-centeredness. Why? Now, let's go even further. Let's take it another layer down. Why? did Satan respond that way to God? God had only been good to him, obviously. Envy. Jealousy. Envy and jealousy is a very, very evil thing that we need to deal with if it tries to become a part of our life. If we see someone that has something we want, we don't need to be envious uh, because that will create a filter and a bad attitude towards others. And there are a lot of scenarios that I could give. But let's go back to the text. The great dragon was cast out, the old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. That's not literal. That's talking about those who are part of the world system. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Again, this happened in what we're reading here at the exaltation of Christ. His place was no longer found in heaven. He was no longer there. Uh, he was cast to the earth, which is why I know he's doing affairs right now. But watch what it says in verse 10. Okay, this is talking about Satan. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them, who are them? <laughs> it's underlined above it. The brethren. Before our God, day and night. So who did Satan accuse to God in heaven before he was cast down? The brethren. Why did he accuse the brethren? Because <laughs> he didn't have to accuse everyone else. They weren't in the faith. So he accused the brethren. I want you to think about it. In the book that is called The Unveiling of Jesus Christ, which reveals many things, of all things for him to be called, he is called what? The accuser of the brethren. Why is he called that? <laughs> because that's what his name means. It's real simple. Okay? Now let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Close your, clothe yourselves with the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Watch this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. So the root of the problem in our struggle is what? These evil forces, these evil rulers, the, the head of that rebellion being Satan, the arch enemy of God. Now, even though the struggle is against this spiritual realm, that spiritual realm can influence and use human beings. Right? That's why you see the analogy in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 where God is not rebuking the king of Babylon or the king of Tyre, but he is actually rebuking the force behind those evil rulers, which is Satan himself. And so Satan can and will operate through even followers of Christ. 
Yeah. You need Bible for that? Somebody say yes. I'm glad you asked. Matthew chapter 16. Jesus takes his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi. I ain't turning there yet because you're going to cheat and look at the screen. I need to give you some foundation here. But he takes them to Caesarea Philippi, and he asks his disciples, who do men say that I am? You know, they say, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven, which tells us that Peter can hear from God. Right? Because he said, My Father revealed that reality, that truth to you. But a few verses later, Jesus goes into telling his disciples openly and plainly for the first time, Listen, guys, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed. The chief elders, the scribes, and the leaders are going to crucify me. But after the third day, I'll be raised from the dead. And you know what Peter does? He rebukes the Lord. Go read it. Don't take my word for it. Matthew 16. He starts rebuking the Lord. You know this guy who just had this awesome confession that was revealed by the Father in him? A few verses later, he's rebuking the Lord because the Lord tells him that I'm going to do what I was sent to this earth to do. And Peter's like, no, uh uh-uh. Now, why would Peter have that attitude? Because he had his eyes focused on this life. And the messianic expectations of even Jesus' followers at this point in his ministry was that Jesus has come, the Messiah is here, he's going to set up his kingdom, and guess what? We're his inner circle. And that means we're going to have authority. And we're going to be his right-hand man. Matter of fact, when you continue reading after this from this point on, for the next few months, while they're making their way to Jerusalem for the final time, the disciples are fussing and fighting over who's going to be at the right hand of Christ in his kingdom, which they thought was going to be on this earth then. And you know what happened? They become powerless. They couldn't even cast out devils anymore. Go read it. Matthew 17. They had to come get Jesus to cast out devils because they no longer had the authority. Why? Because they were envious of one another. They were competing with one another. And even though he could hear from God, guess what? He could also hear from the God of this world. (laughs) Because you know what Jesus' response was after Peter rebuked Jesus? He said, sit down here, Peter. Jesus is going to love on you. Jesus is going to hug on you and pet you on the leg. Tell you how righteous you are, because well ago you told me I was the Christ, the Son of the living God. He turned and he said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. For you are an offense, a stumbling block unto me. That's in red letters. That's Jesus. Jesus, you know, the picture that we have of Jesus on our walls holding a lamb? That's not the only Jesus there really is. Jesus looked at one of his disciples who was entertaining another spirit and says, get behind me, Satan. What's he do? He rebukes the force behind that is influencing him. Get behind me, Satan, adversary. For you are a stumbling block unto me. And he tells us why. For you savor not the things that be of God, but those that be of man. You think you're going to gain something here and now. And that's not how this kingdom operates. It'll come. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's here, but not in full. One day you'll rule and reign on this earth, but not until you suffer. Not until you preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. So what was the root of his problem? He was looking for it in this life because he had faulty expectations that were centered around and connected to this life only. And that led to what? The entertaining of a spirit that was not from God. Are you all with me? This is really good stuff. He was full of envy against especially John and the other apostles. 
In John chapter 6, another example, just to show you. In John chapter number 6, many disciples are following Jesus at this point in his ministry. And Jesus goes on this teaching discourse, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And some of his disciples that didn't have understanding freaked out, and they were offended. And John 6 tells us that they left him, they quit following him, and never followed him again because they got offended at his word. And they got offended because they just didn't understand. But after that happens, Jesus turns to his 12, and he says, you guys going to leave me too? And Peter, you know, he likes to speak up. He says, where would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. Good answer, Peter. Right? This was prior to his confession at Caesarea Philippi, which shows us that he was actually more pure in his infancy in following Christ than he was even later on because he got full of envy and selfish desires of how the kingdom would be fulfilled. But after he speaks up and says, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. This, was, this is Jesus' response. This is kind of bizarre. Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Who's he talking about? The next verse tells us. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think Judas was initially sincere in following Christ? I believe he was. Otherwise, I don't believe Christ would have chosen him. But somewhere over these last few months of his ministry, I believe, especially when they got to Jerusalem, Judas realized this guy really is going to let these evil people kill him. And if he was the Messiah, he wouldn't allow that. Because the Messiah I have drawn up in my mind is a conquering Messiah, right? He's going to crush uh, the enemies, he's going to rule this planet with a rod of iron. Dying on a cross doesn't really sound like ruling this planet with a rod of iron, does it? And so he was confused. And so in his mind, he thought, you know, this thing's about over. Jesus, they're going to kill him. He's going to let them. He really is. This guy is a nut. And because he was Jesus' secretary, you know what he decides? Well, it's time to look out for Judas. You should read John 12 and 13. You'll understand what I just said. And so he gets a plan to betray Jesus for money. Why? Because his expectations were not going to be met. Christ was going to die, and he didn't want that. He wanted Christ to, like, call down legions of angels from heaven kick butt, take names, and then appoint him as one of the head people in charge that will rule the planet with the Messiah. And when that didn't happen, you know what he did? He betrayed him. He's a good guy gone bad. Kind of like who? The devil. That's why he says, have I not chosen you twelve and one of you is a devil? Christ knew it was coming. And he explained that. Are y'all still with me? Let's look what Paul says to the infamous church at Corinth. When I read about the church at Corinth, it is like looking at the American church. I mean, very much so. Study First and Second Corinthians. I wish we had the first letter that he actually wrote to Corinth, the church at Corinth, but... In 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you know what Paul spends the entire time doing? These are the longest letters to any church, by the way. Defending his apostleship. <laughs> because the church at Corinth thought they were smarter than he was. And he spends two letters rebuking them thoroughly. You should read it. And so, you know the church at Corinth that was like really disorderly? really immoral, really compromising with 
pagan feast and things like that and saying it's okay? Yeah, that church. You know, yeah, the hyper-charismatic church that wanted to, to be all about signs and wonders, not about character. You know the church that claimed to be so wise that they didn't, didn't need to hear from Paul anymore? You should read the letters. I mean, Paul is just letting them have it. <laughs> no wonder he got stoned a lot, right? This is what he says in 2 Corinthians, though. He says, But I am afraid that just as the serpent deceived Eve by his trickery, your minds may be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And then a few verses later, he says this, and What I am doing, I will continue to do so that I may eliminate any opportunity for those who want a chance to be regarded as our equals. Who is our? The apostles. The apostles, which were the only ones who carried Binding and loosing authority. Only the apostles. So he's saying, I'm trying to cut off any opportunity for those who want a chance to be regarded as our equals in the things they boast about. Because there was a sect in the church at Corinth that were saying, you don't have to listen to Paul. He don't know what he's talking about. His message is false. We are real apostles. Paul is not. That's what they were doing. Just like at Nazareth, you know, when Jesus taught at his hometown and they said, this is just Jesus. We know his brothers and sisters and his mom and dad. And you know what it says after that? And he could there do no mighty works. Somebody hid my mics. Watch what he says about those people. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. So Satan doesn't look like the first picture that I showed you. It's more like this. Because Satan works through people that will allow him to. And I can shamefully say that in times past, I have allowed him to work through me when I was selfish and immature, just like the church at Corinth. Watch what he says, though. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So remember the first picture I showed you? That's not Satan. He disguises himself as an angel of light. Did you know I've had a lot of people say, I've heard from God, and what came out of their mouth doesn't line up with God's word, you didn't hear from God. You may have heard from a spiritual force, but it wasn't God the creator. You may have heard from a spirit, but it wasn't the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is not a self-centered narcissist. The Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, temperance, faith. And meekness. That's the Holy Spirit. And anything we say out of our mouths that doesn't line up with those attributes is not from the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say this, Therefore, it is not surprising his servants also. <laughs> you know what he's saying about these people that are opposing him at Corinth? They are his servants. Who, who is his? The devil. Therefore, it's not surprising. The devil's servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end shall correspond to their actions. In case you want to see it again. He goes on to say, I say again, let no one think that I am a fool. Do you think an apostle, an established apostle, should even have to make a statement like this to a church? Talk about a rebellious, insubordinate bunch of people. Let no one think that I am a fool. But if you do, then at least accept me as a fool so that I may boast a little. You know what Paul's doing here? 
He said, you seem to only understand foolish talk. So I'm going to talk to you like a fool. So excuse me for just a moment. I'm not speaking on behalf of Christ. This is Paul talking foolishly like you allow and you tolerate and you celebrate. You know what he does after this? He goes on to explain how everyone who calls themselves an apostle, he supersedes their qualifications by leaps and bounds. It's not even measurable by human standards. He just goes off on them and just is like, I mean, to modernize it, who do you think you are challenging my apostleship? So this is what he says. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I do not say the, the way the Lord would. Okay? So he's clarifying. This is not of God. But you don't seem to accept things that are of God. So let me talk to you on your level. Instead, it is, as it were, foolishness. Since many are boasting according to human standards, I too will boast. And he goes off later on on this rant. It, are they Israelites? I am too. Are they apostles? I am more. Have they suffered? I have incomparably. And he just goes off on this rant about what he has accomplished. And then at the end of it, he says, but I count that all as nothing except for the things that I've suffered for his name's sake. He says, none of that, none of the accomplishments, none of the Pharisaic uh, teaching and background that I have means anything. He says, for since you are so wise, you put up with fools gladly. <laughs> That's the American church today. You think they have it all figured out, and they're not teachable. Not here, though. Watch what he says in the next chapter. He says, For I'm afraid that s somehow when I come, I will not find you what I wish, and you will not find me what you wish. I'm afraid that somehow there may be quarreling, jealousy, intense anger, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Sounds like the American church. That's what Paul said about this church, which within 40 years crumbled because they devoured one another, because they wanted the spotlight and the spectacle on themselves. Remember what he says? For since you are so wise, you put up with fools gladly. James picks up on that same thought with the same kind of people, people who can't control their tongue. James chapter 3, watch this. Who is wise and understanding among you? Remember, the Corinthians claimed to be so wise. And Paul said, you're actually the opposite. You're fools. You're babes. I can't even give you meat because you're so carnal. And James picks up on this same train of thought. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let me tell you who's wise and understanding. Did you know the Bible actually makes it really clear? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't fear the Lord, you don't have wisdom. And if you're challenging the apostles appointed by God, like the church at Corinth was, they were challenging Paul. You don't know God because you don't fear God. Because if you feared God, you would fear those whom God appointed, which is being Paul in the letter to the church at Corinth. You all okay? So he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, he should show his works done in the gentleness that wisdom brings, which is rooted in the fear of the Lord. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfishness in your hearts, do not boast and tell lies against the truth. In other words, don't try to justify yourself. Well, the Lord told me. No, no, that ain't the Lord. 
He says, if you have bitter jealousy and selfishness in your hearts, do not boast and tell lies against the truth. Don't claim you're hearing from God. Such wisdom does not come from above. Where does it come from? It is earthly, natural, and demonic. Again, like I said earlier, many people claiming to hear from God, but it's not God. That kind of so-called wisdom, just like the church at Corinth claimed to have such wisdom, it wasn't wisdom from God. It was natural, earthly, and demonic. How do we know? For where there is jealousy and selfishness, there is disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, accommodating. You know what accommodating means? Deferring to others. That is the antithesis of selfishness. Full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and not hypocritical. Watch this in verse 18. And the fruit that consists of righteousness is planted in peace among those who make peace, not those who create division. Right? So selfishness is not wisdom that comes from God, but from another spirit, which is why John says this, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to determine if they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Did you know I can admit and say that there have been times that I thought I heard from the Lord and I I didn't hear from the Lord? And you know how we know and determine that? Does what we hear or what we have heard line up? with God's word and God's character. There's a lot of times that when people make statements, I heard from the Lord, it is very self-promoting. Okay? And we need to be able to weigh and determine whether or not it is from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now in verse 4 he says this, You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them, false prophets, Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world's perspective, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Who's we? He's speaking as an apostle. This is John. The person who knows God listens to us. Listen to us. From a Hebraic perspective means what? Obeys. He who knows God listens or obeys us, the apostles. That's why you need to beware of someone who says that they have received some divine revelation. Um, Concerning doctrine. All revelation concerning doctrine has been given to the apostles in the first century, and they wrote it down for us. They were the only ones that had the power to bind and loose. That's just the way it is. Are you following me? So he says, We are from God. The person who knows God listens to us, but whosoever is not from God does not listen to us. So what does that say about the church at Corinth? They are not part of the believing community because they do not, they were not obeying Paul. But this we know by this. By what? What is this? Whether or not they obey the apostolic teaching. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deceit or deception. Now I'm going to skip through part of this because I want to get to some sayings of Paul, and then I'm going to close. This is what Paul tells the church at Philippi. He says, be imitators of me. What does that mean? Pattern your lives after the pattern that you see in my life. 
brothers and sisters, and watch carefully those who are living this way. So does he call them to make a righteous discernment or a righteous judgment concerning the behavior of others? He does. Just as you have us as an example. Watch what he says, though, in verse 18. For many live about whom I have told you, and now with tears I tell you, they are enemies of the cross of Christ cross of Christ representing Christ's atonement, but it also represents discipleship because Jesus said, whosoever is not willing to carry their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So it represents what Christ has done, creating a new covenant, and that way which is embodied in his teaching. So he says, there are enemies, there are adversaries, there are devils, and he's talking about other people. And that's why we need to be careful of who we allow to influence our life. We need to listen to the words that people say, and we need to evaluate the spirit behind what people are saying. He says they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Why would he say their God is their belly? Because these type of people, guys, I have met so many of them, claim to hear from God all the time. The Holy Spirit told me. God told me. Blah, blah, blah. No. I, don't, I know you don't even spend enough, that much time with God to hear from Him that much. Stop making claims to get your way, to influence people to just follow what you say. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their God is their selfish desires. Because your belly is where your desires come from, your lust. They exult in their shame, and they think about earthly things. They focus on earthly things, which again is why Judas ultimately betrayed Christ. And Peter, um, think about this, guys. Peter, a guy who followed Jesus for three years, nearly walked away and never came back. That's pretty astounding. He walked with Jesus. He saw Jesus stop funerals and raise people from the dead. And he still almost walked away permanently. He did for a time. Watch what he says in Romans. He says, now I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who create dissensions and obstacles contrary to the teaching that you learned. What would that teaching be? the apostolic teaching of the way. What does he say we should do? Avoid them. Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. Avoid them. What does that mean? You don't hang out with them. You don't associate. You don't become close with people like that. Do you have to deal with people like that in life? Yeah, there's no way to get away from it. But to associate, to become close, to give ear to, to allow to influence, we do not tolerate that in our lives. For these are the kind who do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By their smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of the naive, which brings this in full circle to what we just read in Genesis chapter 3, where the serpent deceived Eve. How? By smooth, subtle, crafty talk and flattery. What is flattery? Oh, you know God. He just, he knows the day you eat, you'll be like God's. He's keeping something from you. Appealing to the emotions. Trying to put himself kind of on their level. To trick them. It's a trick. It's a trick. We're going to end with a say, saying from Jude, and then hopefully next week we can start the series on the book of Romans. But these are two verses that I believe we all need to listen to. Jude, the brother of Jesus, half brother of Jesus, says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you 
that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Did you notice it says the faith? Paul affirms that in his letters when he says there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is in us, who is the hope of glory. Even at the time of the early church, they were already having to contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, which is just lustful indulgence in whatever they desire, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, those who were teaching to refuse discipleship and the apostolic teaching. That's what he's warning them of. So, the devil comes in disguise. He is a spiritual force, but he is a spiritual force that uses people, and he is a spiritual force that would like to use each and every one of us. And so we have an obligation as Christians to not be ignorant of his devices. As Paul says to the church at Corinth, we're not ignorant of his devices. But when we see things that contradict God's word, in particular the apostolic teaching, what do we do? We step back and we avoid becoming connected with people that continually allow themselves to be used by the devil. Now listen, we all have screwed up. Let's just be honest. We all have been used by the devil. Even Peter was. But I'm talking about people who, every time you get around them, they're tearing others down. At your workplace. Listen to what people say. And the tone of how they say it. And do not become closely knit with people who criticize and critique others. You do know those are the people that crucified Christ, right? They picked him apart, even though he was perfect. Because that's what devils do. The part that I skipped over was John chapter 8, beginning in verse, around verse number 40, if you want to go home and read that. It goes with what we talked about today. But I want you to be on guard because this is something that I wish that I could have told a lot of people many times in many churches whenever I used to travel and preach in a lot of churches. This is a message that if I had it to do over and I was an evangelist again, this would be a message that every single church I went to, this would be a message that I would preach because it is so relevant in our culture even in our churches, and we need to be on guard. I ask you to stand.